Welcome back to Strategic Advice from MIT's SSP, uh, our security program. I'm Phil Hahn, the host, and I'm joined today by Peter Krauss, who is an associate professor at Boston College and another research uh, affiliate with MIT. Uh, Peter, welcome back to Strategic Advice. Thanks so much for having me back, Phil. Looking forward to talking again. Yeah, I always learn a lot when you're uh, engaging with material. I can't wait to learn today about uh, the first topic of two today is on uh, term papers. Before I turn it over to you, I just want to give a disclaimer that the advice that are given is our own and doesn't necessarily, the views don't necessarily uh, represent those of our institutions. So, Peter, you know, this, uh, this series, this second uh, year series is aimed at a brand new uh, PhD who has finally caught the car. They have landed that tenure track job and now they have the challenge of putting together courses to teach and today's topic is on term papers so over to you wonderful again thanks again phil and i i certainly remember that time period where i got the bc job when i was finishing up at mit uh, i was so excited but also you know a little bit scared about now teaching all my own classes for the first time um, i actually was a high school teacher for a couple of years before i came to mit to get my phd so i had a little teaching experience but nonetheless designing and teaching your own college class for the first time is intimidating. And there's a reason that for many students and new professors, your first year in particular, you feel like you get almost nothing done except for teaching because you literally could spend every waking minute designing term papers, designing course syllabi, and it still wouldn't be perfect. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is some guidance about how to think about doing these things. And of course, recognizing that this is something that evolves over time. I mean, you and I have now been teaching for over a decade or two, and I still update how I do term papers papers and syllabi, et cetera. So in terms of term papers, the first thing I'll say is that you know, as much as we may have some rough memories of writing term papers in college or cramming, although maybe since we became professors, we actually had good memories, who knows? Um, but I think when term papers are done right, they're really the culmination of all of the skills that we want our students to develop in our classes. But to make term papers work for you and for the students, you really need to structure your course around them accordingly. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to do a big paper. Okay, here's the assignment. Go and give it to me in the semester. That's not going to be the best for you. It's not going to be the best for the student. So let me just start for a moment and say, take a step back. Why do we want to do term papers? Some people do exams, and I think exams are just fine as part of a course. But I personally am a really strong proponent of doing term papers. Exams can be a good forcing function to learn and apply the material, but to me, the impact of exams is pretty fleeting. Term papers, on the other hand, I think when they're done well, they require the application of all of these key skills over a prolonged period of time. And the product and the experience of writing a term paper will stay with the student long after the course ends. I can't remember almost any exam that I had in college. I apologize. I'm a poli-sci professor, but I don't really remember too many poli-sci exams. But I can remember many of the term papers that I wrote and all of the most important ones. So to me, exams set up students to be consumers of knowledge and term papers set up students to be producers of knowledge, which is many ways where we're trying to get people to go. Okay, so what does a good term paper force a student to do? To me, it forces them to be effective at framing an interesting puzzle or question finding and generating powerful theories and arguments, clearly defining key concepts and terms, systematically setting up a rigorous research design, finding and analyzing quality sources, providing original analysis of those sources alongside competing claims and complex facts, presenting a clear argument amidst uncertainty, and then identifying policy and practical implications. Now, that's a lot of different skills, but to be honest, those are the same skills that you and I and other professors use in our own research. And I think that term papers, when done right, push students to use some of those skills, even if they're doing so for the first time. So how do you set up a course to do this? Because again, even if you want all those skills to be practiced, you can't just tell a student to do them. To me, what you need to do is you need to actually structure the course to teach and introduce those skills over time. You should not assume that students know how to do research design or how to generate original arguments or how to generate a quality question. And even if they've done that a little bit before, they haven't done it a ton. I mean, I still think all the time of how can I generate a clearer, more interesting question for my next book or article or otherwise. So I think you need to teach students this stuff. 
Now, one of the challenges is that people think, hey, that takes a lot of time. I'm trying to plan a class and it just takes so much time just to think about the content of, you know, the conflict I'm going to talk about or the country I'm going to talk about or et cetera. How could I also teach these skills on top of that? One of the things that I found is that even in small amounts of time, a portion throughout the semester, you can do this stuff and it actually becomes one of the most rewarding things about your about your classes. And it makes the students engage with the material at a deeper level because now they're not just learning it to learn it. They're learning it while they're applying these different skills that they then apply later on the term paper. So how do you want to do about this, you know, do this stuff? I'd say a couple of things. First is plan these skills kind of in a hands-on accessible way. And what that means is, hey, it can just be like 10 minutes at the beginning of a class, say once a week or even once every other week. We'll do something like, hey, here's a handout on what makes a good researchable question. You know, it's clearly framed. Um, it potentially is based on a puzzle, something that doesn't seem to line up with what you would expect. Maybe it's based on a comparison of a couple different cases that seem to go different ways. I mean, all the different things that might make a good research question, you hand it out to the students, you talk a little bit about that. And then when you go through, say, the readings that day for class, you focus on the question that that scholar or those authors asked about and think about why did they frame the question that way and how did that motivate their research, et cetera. And that makes them really sink into the reading, not just in terms of what the author is saying, but how they're actually planning to, say, frame their project or ask that question. Um, if you do this a little bit along the way, and again, it could be as few as like two or three or four skills. It could be as much as like one new skill each week. Again, I think this is a way that you can set your students up to write and research great term papers because when it comes time to then say, okay, now write this 12 or 15 or 20 or whatever page term paper at the end, they don't start from scratch saying, how do I even ask a question for the paper or how do I generate a hypothesis or how do I do a comparative case study? They have done it in practice, those little skills along the way. And again, that's something I do in my classes where I give a handout. Maybe they have an assignment where for that day, there's a question on the topic of the day and they have to generate three potential hypotheses that could answer that question. Or maybe it's like we're studying this case of this certain conflict on a given day. It's like, okay, can you think of another case that would make an interesting case comparison? Again, you using certain standards that we've talked about previously about what makes a good case comparison for structured focus, you know, case analysis. Um, the final thing I'll say in terms of setting things up is, again, it takes a little more time, but in my classes, I also have the students do a research proposal whereby they do like a three to four page proposal about halfway through the class where they frame these three basic things, a research question, um, potential hypotheses and arguments that they'll analyze, maybe two to four of them, and then a planned research design. Again, I often focus on case comparisons because I think it's something that students can do and is accessible. Many of them don't necessarily have the training in doing, you know, extensive archival research, um, you know, in great depth and just looking at a single case or doing, you know, statistical analysis. So structured focus case comparison is something I think students can do. So if they hand in that proposal, I meet with each of the students and give them some feedback. The papers that they then do in the month or so after are so much better. And it's better for me as a, a grader and seeing them grow. And it's certainly better for them getting some of that initial feedback and heading off some of those problems. Even though they've had some of that practice and exposure before, having that process of proposing something, getting feedback, now working on it again, we all know that's the process of how you do good research. I think when term papers go bad or badly, it's because students are just asked to do something. They're given little guidance about it. And then they hand it at the end and maybe they don't even get feedback. Or if they get feedback after the semester, it's like, well, I'm not ever going to look at this again, right? So if you do that iterative process with them, that teaches them implicitly and explicitly how to do this good work. Two final points. Um, in terms of actual kind of uh, publishing of these things, I think that's a final thing that you can ask students, or at least not ask, but suggest them as an outlet. When you and I were undergrads, there are almost no, at least that I remember, like undergraduate journals or things you could publish in. It's kind of like you wrote a paper and that's it. Now at Boston College, and I'm sure at MIT and elsewhere, there are so many. There's political science journals, international studies journals, there's Middle East studies journals, et cetera. And so I encourage my students, I say, look, after this semester, if you're interested in publishing this paper, you know, reach out to me and I'll give you feedback, not just on the paper, but how to potentially shrink or condense or set it up to be published in these types of outlets that are maybe a few thousand words or something like that. And every semester, I have a few students who do so. And it's a really nice culminating thing to say, hey, I'm now a published author. This is a nice writing sample for grad school 
school or for um, a job in the future. Um, and it's a great thing to have on your CV and just feel a sense of like, hey, I've written something here that's that's original. Obviously, it's not, you know, some peer reviewed, uh, you know, professor level journal, but a lot of these journals are, you know, peer reviewed by other students. They have faculty advisors. So that's another way that, again, you can talk to students and teach them about you're doing this same process that we are doing as professors. Now, certainly much less time and the expectations for how much original argument, original evidence you have is a little bit smaller, but it doesn't mean you're not learning these important skills that you can apply at a broader or longer level in the future. So I think the publishing thing is really important. Um, and again, the final point I'll say is just thinking about the time element. Um, it seems overwhelming when you're planning a course to think about how you train and teach skills and term papers alongside all the content, but just doing a little bit of it and bringing that up, I think can keep the course fresh and it can teach these students skills that they'll hold with them even after the course is long over. So that's how I think about term papers. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your experience with it, Phil, or your thoughts on it. Well, well, thanks, Peter. That, that gave me a lot to think about in terms of integration. So I have two questions for you. The, the one has to do with differences between grad students and undergrads as far as expectations. And the other has to do with, uh, you know, my experience with doing good term papers is, is it's, a, it's an investment of time up front with the students, as you're saying. And so for big courses, how do you balance that? Or do you have experience with TAs? as far as helping to develop them in order to help you with the students. Over. Great question. So yeah, at BC, I'm fortunate enough that my regular size classes are 35 students and my seminars are 15. Now, some people with a 35 student class might not do term papers. I still do. So all of my 15, 35 student classes, um, I do term papers. I've rarely taught classes larger than that. One time I did teach a 150 student class for which I had TAs. So I still did do with my co-teacher, um, a term paper of sorts, but yes, they were graded by the TAs and they also did a presentation, which then we graded. So if you have a class of that size, yes, it's very tough to imagine grading 150, you know, 20 page papers in any type of depth. That's a great deal of work by the, by the professor. Um, and so you knew, do need to have both faith in your TAs. And yes, I think you then have to, as you say, work with those TAs to talk about how we teach and evaluate these skills and good writing uh, in the among the students. But I will say the size of the class does not limit how many people you can teach these skills to. So yes, maybe your ability to evaluate, you know, a 20 page paper for 150 students is very difficult. Difficult. But you can certainly do these smaller assignments of developing some of these skills that, again, I think the TAs can maybe even do a better job of grading and evaluating than the longer papers. So I wouldn't be deterred necessarily by the size of the class, though I do think maybe you have to adjust a little bit the, assi the assignment and certainly think about the amount of time you can commit. Maybe your very first year, you know, you do small versions of this where you do a shorter memo or some sort of research paper that's more five to 10 pages and teach a couple of these skills as you're building out your content knowledge and presentation of that stuff. But then maybe over time, once you feel more confident in your syllabus and your course, you know, a couple of years in, maybe you could have kind of longer research papers. So yeah, there's certainly ways you can modulate this. The other thing I liked about, or the final thing we have time for it, is this, this idea of a proposal and the interaction and feedback before the paper is due. I've spent a lot of time um, looking at formative versus summative feedback. Formative meaning you're providing information to the students going forward summative being an evaluation of their work and the research suggests that as soon as a student reads their grade they don't read any other comments after summative it becomes a legalistic type of document so i've tried to minimize the amount of time doing that and focus instead on the front so i really like this idea uh, and i do the same thing which is encouraging students to consider publication and so using the final grade more as a formative assessment to say, if you want to publish this, these are the steps that you need to continue with this research. Uh, has it, have you changed how you do your evaluations at the end as well? Yeah, the formative one, again, you have the, the it's high level pedagogical terms, which I love. Um, I will say that, you know, my first year or two, I, I took every single paper and I was having, you know, 235 student classes per semester. And I was writing super detailed comments on every single one. And again, BC students are great. And I would say like the majority of them, you know, picked up their papers, but a number did not. And so there certainly was some sense of, as you're saying, okay, like having to do that at that period is maybe not the best way. So putting more and more time into writing comments on the proposals, which is mid-semester, and then again, 
Again, I require every student to have a 10 to 15 minute meeting with me after I grade those proposals to talk through that stuff. I 100% agree. Not only are they still in the middle of the semester, but now they still have something else they have to do with this information, this advice, and you know their own thoughts on editing, et cetera. So I do think that the proposal and the feedback there is probably far more valuable for them than the feedback that I give on their final paper, if that makes sense. So 100% agree with that. And I'll also say, you know, from a faculty member's perspective, and from the student's perspective, so much of our semesters are loaded at the end, at the very end. So having something that a lot of the efforts in the middle, I think can break things up both for you and for them in terms of their attention. And so you can have better success in that way. Yeah. And, and the other advantage is that some schools require midterm grades for undergrads, and it gives you an opportunity to get another uh, formal assessment along the way. Well, that's all the time we have today. What a fantastic discussion on term papers. Uh, anyway, goodbye today for uh, from advice uh, to grad students from MIT SSP. Anyway, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Phil.